A young man awakens from a deep slumber to find himself leaning against a tree in an unknown forest. The forest itself doesn't seem to be the only thing that's unknown though. For when he steps over to a nearby lake to wash his face, he sees an unfamiliar reflection looking back at him from the water. He's in a completely new body from his own. Confused, and more than a little worried for obvious reasons, he thinks back on how this could have happened. For now, his best guess is that this must be a result of the technique known as Nirvana Soul Grasping. A technique that he'd allowed his coon to learn. Manifesting as a passive skill, this technique is every bit as insanely broken as it is seemingly impossible. In the case of his spirit beast tamer's death, it causes their soul to leave their body unharmed. After that, a random person's soul is chosen and the tamer's own is placed in their body, replacing the original soul. The only downside is that this process takes a full year, a small price to pay for a do-over though. Faced with the fact that his previous self has died, he becomes overtaken with sadness and disappointment. Back then, he truly believed that he could find the truth once he got into the Grand Clan. But instead, it would seem all he's gotten is failure. Not only is he now in a completely new body that he has to start over with, but the coon dies after using Nirvana Soul Grasping. Until he can build himself back up, he's more vulnerable than he has been in quite a while. Despite having a second chance, he can't help but despair at just how far back he's been set with this. Thinking back on his death, he remembers that the coon he was trying to evolve turned into some kind of terrible monster. This was despite him considering all the possible factors for the process as carefully as possible. The only logical conclusion is a simple one. He's been betrayed by someone who was close enough to know everything they need to. Other than that, it makes no sense who could have done it since no one knows the true secret of the coon. Putting his past life aside for now though, he tries to focus on this new one. The body he finds himself in now had to belong to some new one after all. So what exactly was he doing out here in the middle of the wilderness? Something tells me he won't like the answer to that. Sure enough, just moments after he thinks this, a whole group of guards appear and surround him. From their uniforms, he can tell they're guardians of the White Palace, the Second Grand Clan. Right as he tries to talk to them though, the leader yells out to him to shut his mouth and tell them where he's keeping their lady captive. Oh, well, that's not good. The man tries desperately to explain that the situation isn't what they think, but the guards are determined. They know this man kidnapped their lady and they well get her back. Sure enough, the lead guardian doesn't even wait for him to speak and attacks at once, swinging his sword in a wide arc. Jumping back, the man realizes he has no other option here but to fight. Luckily, he can sense that this body already has two spirit beasts bound to it. Quickly, he summons the first one, expecting it to be a wild-type beast. And it is, just, not in the way he would have liked. It's a tiny puppy that starts humping its own master's leg. Damn, seeing this, the White Palace Guardians are convinced that he has trained even his beasts to be shameless perverts like himself. Giving up on the humping pup, the man summons forth his second beast, a wood-based spiritual vine beast. This one's sure to be much more helpful, so he orders it to go forth. Unfortunately, there's a trend with this body's beasts. The vine beast shoots its vines at the nearest female guardian and ties her up in a fairly compromising position. Naturally, this only further cements the suspicions of the guardians who take down both beasts and restrain the man. With him restrained in their hold, the guardians quickly discover a cabin nearby that belongs to the previous owner of this body. Even worse, they discover a basement where not only the White Palace's lady, but several others are also being held captive. Sure enough, the lead guardian draws his blade, ready to execute him on the spot, but not before revealing his name. Or rather, the name of the body he now inhabits. He's Liu Feng Meng. With the blade poised to strike, he can only rage internally at how he's about to die once more just an hour after being reborn. Strangely enough though, the very lady he had kidnapped orders her guardians to stand down. At their confusion, she tells them to take Liu to White Palace. She has her own plans for handling him. Later that night, after being held prisoner for most of the day, the guardian from before leads Liu to the lady's personal chambers. It's time to see just what she has in store for him. Once he steps in, she greets Liu, calling him Little Pervert. She reveals the only reason he captured her was due to the poison he tricked her into drinking. She, Bai Li and Su, has never suffered such a humiliation before. As she speaks down to him, her spirit beast slowly appears and coils around her seat, an intimidating white serpent. Sitting there with all the power in her hands, she tells Liu what she has planned for him to sate her anger. She'll keep him in the White Palace forever and turn him into her personal slave. Hearing her plans for him, Liu instantly tells her it's not happening. When she looks surprised, he starts ranting on and on about how he's only ever known a pampered life, so he'd be useless as a servant of any sort. 
Even as she angrily grinds out that this isn't a negotiation or a deal, Lever just turns around and casually starts walking out. As he steps through the door with a comically terrified expression on his face, he tells her she should find somebody else for her purposes. Of course, Lee and Sue isn't exactly going to just take that kind of answer either. When Lee refuses to turn back, she sends her serpent, Bay, after him. At her command, the snake throws itself towards Liu, ready to swallow him whole or at least get a few bites in. Even with his arms still bound, Liu just barely manages to dodge the snake, though it does knock him to the ground outside. Now in the courtyard, man and snake lock eyes as a straight-up battle seems to be the only possible next course of action. Standing up from her seat back in her own room, Lady Sue tells Liu that if he wishes to leave this place, he'll have to get through Bay. For his part, Liu decides that he might as well give this his all if that's what it's come down to. He raises his hand and summons forth both his spirit beasts, only to find them still sleeping off the fatigue from the previous battle. More than a little annoyed, Liu yells at the two to get prepared for battle as there's no more time for resting. Still new to these beasts, he tells them to just unleash their full power and do the best they can against their opponent. Determined to make their master proud, the dog and plant beasts go forth only to be beaten. Or rather, that's what it seems like at first, but they've actually trapped Bay. Stuck in the mighty serpent's jaws, the vine beast unleashes its vines onto the snake's entire body. In just moments, it has the creature completely bound and tied up in, yet again, a rather compromising position. These beasts really are as pervy as their former master. And is that a blush on the damned snake? While the vine beast holds Bay in place, the puppy comes flying in for a devastating piss to the serpent's head. Wait, what? That's some witty move. With that, the beast is firmly defeated and left lying on the floor. Though certainly shocked by the defeat, Lady Sue was more outraged by just how indecent the strategy was. Even so, it worked for now so Liu can't really complain. Right as things are looking up, so too does the White Snake, rising up in its shackles of vines and activates a special skill at Lady Sue's command, Burning Scales. With this, everything that's in contact with the snake's body is burnt to an utter crisp. Sure enough, Liu's vine beast is quickly defeated and its trap reduced to ashes. When the dog beast tries to attack, Bay just swats it away with a flick of its massive tail. With this latest development, things look more grim than ever for Liu. Lady Sue is determined to make things even worse for him. She orders Bay forward, and the snake crashes into Liu with staggering force. Even as he tries to push the creature back, Liu is thrown into the yard's pond. Inside this pond, Liu stays underwater for a few moments to assess his situation. With both his beasts defeated, there's not really much hope of him winning this battle. Luckily for him, right as he thinks this his savior appears next to him. When Liu finally emerges from the surface of the pond, Lady Su smugly asks if he's had enough and is ready to give in to her demands. To her surprise though, Liu simply brings up his hand and summons a new spirit beast. A third one which he didn't have until just moments ago. And it's a fish. And not just any fish, but the single mudfish that was inside the pond. Lady Su breaks out into a fit of hysterical laughter at Liu's desperate action. She tells him about a story regarding mudfish. Years ago, the mudfish were very popular because the grandmaster of the Ling Shao clan cultivated one into an undefeatable great coon. However, about a year ago, that very coon went berserk and swallowed the master in a great battle on the mountain peak just last year. Hang on, this sounds kind of familiar. After that incident, the Leap put out an extermination order for all mudfish on the continent, leaving them nearly extinct. The one in this pond only lives because Lady Sue's brother raised it in secret. Lady Sue laughs in Liu's face, telling him the Grandmaster was the only one who knew the secrets to cultivating a mudfish. Trash like him could never hope to do the same. When Liu brushes off her insult, she sends Bei forth once again to attack. As the serpent draws close, Liu orders the mudfish, named Nin Chan, to go ahead. Liu catches the snake's jaws in his hands even as they pierce his skin and cause intense bleeding. While he occupies the beast, Nin Chan moves behind it and takes its tail into its mouth. Is this another inappropriate move of some sort? It feels like one. Annoyed by his insolence, Lady Su orders Bei to finish him off. At the same time though, Liu yells at Nin Chan to do the same. In just a moment, the fish unleashes a sucking force more powerful than that of my childhood bully's mother. Little by little, the entirety of the white serpent is pulled into the mudfish. From his position, Liu calls out one single order, swallow it all. Ooh, all the inappropriate jokes I can think of right now. I should get help. With the white serpent swallowed and stored away safely inside Nin Chan's digestive system, the battle is over and Liu is safe. 
Lady Sue, on the other hand, is horrified. She falls to her knees with tears pooling in her eyes at the loss of her spirit beast. Meanwhile, Nin Chan provides a drawn-out Belch's background music, real classy. Liu pulls himself out of the pond and calls Nin Chan back to himself, dispelling the summoning. Turning to the inconsolable Su, he tells her he had no other choice but to have her beast swallowed because of her aggression. With that last jab, he hops onto the compound's wall and leaps off outside. Finally, Lady Su feels something other than despair. She's moved on to absolute, unadulterated, burning rage. With a single yell, she calls the squad of guardians who brought Liu to the palace to begin with. Consumed by the fires of her absolute fury, she commands them to go after Liu and capture him, even allowing them to use their spirit beasts freely, something which is normally reserved for matters of great importance. Meanwhile, Liu races through the forest, running at full speed to get the hell away from his pursuers. In his desperation, he ends up running through the whole night. The next morning, he arrives near what appears to be a station. This is what is known as the Spirit Beasts Express. Here, travelers can rent a spirit beast suited for being used as a mount and make their journeys both faster and easier. Right before Liu arrives, a couple actually demonstrate this by renting a scorpion beast kitted out with a saddle for riding on. Almost immediately after that couple's departure, Liu arrives at the station master's booth and demands a speed-based spirit beast. To do so, he mentions this second Grand Level clan he's from and tells the man to charge it to their membership account. The man is quite pleasant about the whole situation, asking Liu to simply tell them the clan's password with gestures included. For some reason, this makes Liu feel embarrassed. Deciding to get on with it though, he does as asked. To the station master's utmost cringe, he engages in a weird little dance with just as weird phrases. All right, I get the embarrassment now. After just barely reigning in his expression at what he's been witness to, the station master starts looking through his records to confirm the password. Meanwhile, Liu just regrets allowing an old friend from the clan, Gao Ling, to set the password. After a false alarm about not finding the password, the station master confirms it's in the records. Liu asks him to lend him their fastest beast, perhaps a dark shadow panther, immediately upon hearing this, not waiting for any further talk. Unfortunately for him, the man informs him that his clan's level isn't high enough to rent such a beast. Confused at first since his clan should easily be at a high enough level, Liu suddenly realizes what must have happened. Based on Lady Su's story about him and the coon last night, news of that incident must have spread across the lands. And with that, their reputation must have suffered greatly as well since it's been a full year. Turning to the station master, Liu demands to know just how far the clan was demoted. To his confusion, the man is extremely reluctant to speak up with an answer. Getting frustrated, Liu bans his hands on the desk and demands to know the answer to his question. Still hesitant, but not wanting to risk any damage to his place, he reveals what he knows. At some point in this past year that he was gone, the Ling Xiao clan was completely eliminated, wiped off the face of the earth. Back in the White Palace, the squad of guardians has returned to their lady, unsuccessful in their task to hunt down Liu. When they come to face Lady Su, the lead guardian bows down in apology for their failure. He tells her they chased after Liu for a full 10 miles, but there was simply no trace of him anywhere. The most likely possibility is that he's hidden somewhere they can't reach. Despite the explanation, Lady Sue is absolutely furious, telling them they're worthless and absolute failures. Dan Lady, harsh much. Ashamed of their own inability to catch the man, the Guardians apologize to Lady Sue profusely, luckily for them. Before things can escalate any further, someone else arrives on the scene. Riding atop a massive evil spirit beast and garbed in a regal white and gold attire, he is none other than Lady Sue's older brother. Back with Liu, he's sitting with his back to a tree, his head held in one hand as he mentally goes over what he learned earlier. Over the course of the year he's been gone, his clan fell to utter ruins before being blown away on the winds, never to be heard of again. He got a record of the dealings of the clans from the station master who broke the news to him. According to those records, it wasn't a quick decline either. In the fifth month of the second grand year, the clan was demoted by two levels due to Liu's death. Then, in the eighth month of the same year, the Liu clans put out an order for all Kun to be killed, as well as all the spirit beasts of their clan. With that, the clan was demoted even further to the absolute bottom. Finally, in the second month of the next year, the clan finally succumbed to all the losses they had faced. Between their spirit beasts being gone and their rank fallen so low, the next blow was the final nail in their coffin. The sanction of other clans. With this, they became a forgotten clan. Man, this is depressing.
With this knowledge now plaguing him, Liu can only regret everything that's happened. He even blames himself for it, thinking that it's because he put too much effort into improving his own abilities when he should have been improving the clans. Meanwhile, at the White Palace, Lady Su can be seen absolutely wearing her brother's ears out. The one who can't stop ranting about everything Liu did and how he took down her white snake. Tearfully, she begs her brother to help get revenge on Liu. Her brother, on the other hand, is focused on one particular part of her story. One that frustrates him far more than anything else this supposed pervert has done. He stole the mud fish he's been raising in secret for such a long time. Deciding to try a different tactic, Lady Su tells him the mud fish is extremely powerful. As such, he should grant her a strong spirit beast that can take it out. Her brother's response, however, leaves her even more shocked than before. According to him, the mudfish is actually an extremely weak beast. That swallow skill isn't powerful at all. As a matter of fact, if she ordered her snake to fight back even a little bit, the skill would have been interrupted and failed. When he scolds her for not knowing such things, she can only be embarrassed and insists that she did actually fight back. Back with Liu, he finds the little mudfish he's contracted with making an attempt to cheer him up. Comforted by the little creature's kindness, Liu assures her that he won't give up until he's avenged the destruction of his clan, as long as he's here with him. Liu will turn the tables on his circumstances. At the same time, he and Lady Su's brother are speaking on a topic in the same vein. The older brother tells Su that only the Grandmaster Fun Ling Chiyo knows the secret of cultivating a mudfish into a great coon. Liu, speaking to the mudfish, tells that he knows the secret to make it undefeatable. As the older brother tells Su that he'll catch the little pervert sooner or later, Liu speaks to the mudfish once more. He tells the creature that if it wishes to become the legendary being people across the lands admire, its own efforts will be vital, pointing up the skies above. He tells the fish that he hopes it can swallow everything this time around, and then stand by his side at the very top of the world. Or float, I guess. It's a fish. Since he's effectively broke with his clan destroyed, Liu decides to just cash out whatever money is left in the clan's account with the station. To his disappointment, even this amount is absolutely pathetic, a mere 6 big coins and 36 small ones. With an amount like that, he's barely any better off than being broke anyways. Taking that into consideration, he decides to keep his budget as tight as possible so he can save up. After all, he'll need to earn plenty of money for the resources needed to evolve Nin Chan into a coon. As his first act, he asks the station master to lend him the cheapest riding beast they have. Unfortunately, even he didn't anticipate just how low the quality of the ride would go at that price. The beast he's given is a giant pig with a saddle slapped onto it. Very underwhelming. Things kind of cute though. As they travel to their destination, Liu explains to the confused Nin Chan why he's being so cheap right now. It's only a temporary situation, but they need to meet the criteria to really make Nin Chan stronger. And for that, they need to have him learn the spirit beast's skills. And for that, they need to buy said skills from a skill shop. Luckily, there's one just up ahead in the town they've arrived at. This is Xian Lu Town, a place teeming with spirit beasts roaming around freely and with their masters alike. As they walk through the place, Liu finally provides some information on the land's history. This is the fantasy continent where many spirit beasts and even demons live freely. Those who live on this continent create a happy and peaceful life living alongside said beasts. Not only that, they also enjoy matches between said beasts, so we're just completely in a more primitive Pokemon world now. Got it. In the present day, spirit beasts have come to become an essential part of people's day-to-day -day lives. In the town, Liu dismounts the pig he rode in on and tells it to return to the station with some praise. With Nin Chan out and floating near his head, Liu decides to head to a gathered crowd nearby and see what's up exactly. Nothing good for him, apparently. It's a notice on the town's news bulletin that issues an order for all water-based mudfish in the area to be eliminated. If anyone even sees one, they must either kill or report it. Horrified, Liu quickly dispels Nin Chan's summoning before anyone can see him properly. That was a little too close. Stepping away from the crowd, Liu decides it's probably best for Nin Chan to stay out of sight until they can make him stronger. Before that, though, it's time to assess the power of this body he's found himself in. For that purpose, Liu heads to a spirit beast recovery shop nearby. Inside, he's met by a nurse, Joy Knockoff, who takes both his injured spirit beast for healing at his request. Before she heads to the back, he tells her he'd also like power checks for each of them. Not much later, fake nurse Joy comes back with the vine and dog beast wrapped up in bandages. Along with them, she hands Liu a pair of papers that hold the stats of his beasts. Though both of them are at rookie levels 7 and 8, their mature skills are rather strange. To put it lightly, they're very inappropriate, basically. 
One thing that does surprise Liu though is that his dog Beefs has a poison sub attribute, something that can be quite useful for various purposes. That aside, he has to make both his beasts stronger since they're only at rookie level. But at the same time, he also needs to cultivate Ninchan into a coon. Making up his mind, Liu heads to his next destination. Entering a skill shop, Liu speaks to the clerk and asks to buy the defensive skill Aqua Shield. Luckily, the skill only costs 4 big coins so Liu can afford it. Unluckily though, someone else has their eyes set on it as well. Stepping into the store, a nasty looking man with a slave's leash in his hand speaks up. He'll buy the skill at triple the price so it should be sold to him. Never heard of first come first serve, has he? Turning to the man in the entrance, the clerk apologizes to him and tells him the aqua armor skill's sale has already been confirmed so she can't help him. Liu even turns to him and angrily asks if he knows what first come first serve is. Hey, I said that too. Like any other generic thuggish bad guy though, this man's not willing to take no for an answer. With a smug look on his face, he summons forth a massive lion spirit beast that lets loose a terrifying roar. In the commotion, he silently moves to the counter and grabs the aqua armor skill scroll before anyone can react. Seeing the situation play out before him, Liu can only choke on his own rage. Knowing that he can't afford to fight this guy at his current level, but even so, how can he just watch the aqua armor he needed being stolen away like this? Before the situation can get worse though, something surprising happens. The thug actually recognizes Liu, or rather, he recognizes the body of the original Liu, even referring to him as brother to show respect. Figures that a perverted kidnapper like him would know such thugs. Happy to be reunited with his comrade, the thug takes Liu to an inn where they share a meal. Here, they discuss where Liu's been recently since they haven't been able to meet. Not knowing what else to say, but also not wanting to blow his cover, Liu just tells him he's been relaxing at home and enjoying his daily life. However, the thug's next words reveal that the original Liu's daily life consists of playing with beautiful girls. And based on the kidnapped ladies from his home's basement, they probably weren't very agreeable to any of it. This guy really is scummier and scummier the more he learns about him. As if that wasn't bad enough, the thug starts praising Liu for being a master at seduction and tells him the love potion skill he taught him before has been really effective. That's far from comforting. Just what has this scumbag been up to? Of course, things can always get even worse, as shown by what the thug does next. The slave he was carrying around the market now sits on the floor near them. And with a bag on its head removed, Liu can see it's actually a humanoid spirit beast. One known as the Speedy Ares, it's clear from her condition that the thug has been far from gentle with her. As if her dirty appearance wasn't enough to confirm that, his next words certainly are. He practically boasts about how it took him days to capture the beast, but it was worth it for the creature's beauty and body. He even offers for Liu to check said body. There are no words for the levels of hell this scum is headed for. Going on, the thug talks about how humanoid beasts are numerous in their Hong Huang gang and people use them for amusement when they grow tired of human women. It would seem he wants the speedy Ares for precisely such a purpose along with the aqua armor skill. He wants to have the beast learn it so it's even more appealing to customers who wish to rent it. Okay, I take it back. This is a lot more messed up than Pokemon. From everything he's heard, Liu has a pretty solid image now of what kind of person previously possessed this body. For now though, he has to play along to get what he wants. Since the thug seems to respect him, he asks him if he can just give up the aqua armor skill since he really needs it. Instead, he ends up being roped into a drinking contest with this skill as a prize. This terrifies Liu as he was an extreme lightweight in his past life and will probably start babbling about who he is. Luckily for him, the body of Liu has a much higher alcohol tolerance and he ends up not even feeling buzzed by the end of the contest. The thug on the other hand is right on the verge of passing out. With this, Liu now has the aqua armor skill and turns to leave. As long as he can teach this to Nin Chan, or rather, Kun Chan now, this can count as a win. His whole purpose right now is to strengthen the mudfish after all. Before he leaves though, he has one more matter to attend to. He turns to the bound and gagged Ares and raises his hand towards it. The beast recoils in fear, clearly traumatized by the thug already. What Liu actually does, however, shocks her. He takes off her gag and releases her bindings. With that, he tells her to hurry and run away. Later, we can see Liu has arrived at a secluded lake in the middle of the forest. With the amount of water present here, it's the perfect spot to have Kun Chan practice the aqua armor skill. As the little munfish gets excited by the idea of getting stronger, Liu explains exactly how the process works. The scroll that holds the aqua armor skill must be absorbed by him. 
The way it works is that spirit beast tamers store post-mature skills of their own beasts into scrolls. Then, those scrolls can be used to awaken that skill in other beasts who are compatible with it. Here, Liu opens the scroll and wraps it over the top of Kun Chan's body. Don't ask why I searched this, but the QR code on it actually scans to show the Japanese kanji for the word blister. I have no life, all right. As the scroll dissolves away, the skill is absorbed into Kun Chan's body, which is now glowing the cool blue. The process was successful, and the mudfish now possesses the aqua armor skill. Seems a little too easy, but good for them. Now, Liu explains to Kun Chan what the skill is exactly. It forms a protective barrier of water to block enemy attacks, or, alternatively, it can create a protective layer on the master of the spirit beast that serves as literal armor. Since the skill consumes a large amount of water to use, this lake is the perfect training location. As he mentioned earlier as well. Turning to Kun Chan with a smile, Liu tells him to go ahead and give it a shot. Eager to please, the munfish puts all his focus into performing the task Liu described. He's actually able to raise a large ball of water from the lake, but doesn't get far beyond that. When he tries to actually channel and shape it into a proper barrier, the ball of water flies right into Liu's face at breakneck speeds and leaves him soaked. Kumin Chan is really embarrassed by the failure and rushes to Liu in concern. However, Liu tells him that it's totally fine. He just needs to keep trying. After all, practice makes perfect. For the next attempt, Kun Chan actually manages to channel and shape the water into a layer around Liu. Unfortunately, it's an extremely thick and bulky layer that leaves him unable to breathe. Yeah, this is going to take a lot of work. What feels like a full eternity later, Kun Chan has finally mastered the aqua armor skill. The layer of water he can now create around Liu is the perfect density, shape, and thickness. If not for the slight shimmering appearance of water, it would almost seem like it's not even there. With this done, Liu tells Kun Chan that it's time for the next step. He has to swallow him. Pardon me? What? Kun Chan is extremely concerned by what his master is asking him to do. He even wonders if the man has just gone insane. But Liu is quick to reassure the aquatic beast that this is not the case. The method he's about to employ might seem insanely weird, but he knows secrets that nobody else does, and this is one of them. Plus, the water layer of aqua armor will protect him from any harm so it's really a completely safe process. Though he's not fully convinced, Kun Chan decides to follow his master's wishes. In one mighty suck, he swallows the entirety of Liu's body into himself. And then he waits. And he waits a little more. And then a little more. And then he starts freaking the hell out. Liu really did just bring on his own death. Once again though, the Munfish's master is there to reassure it that he's just fine. And he says that from inside of Kun Chan. And the fish hears him from there. Somehow. Don't even ask at this point. From inside Kun Chan. Liu explains that he's now inside the fish's stomach. You see, the munfish possess the swallow ability which allows them to swallow literally just about any object, even if it's far greater than them in size. The thing that makes this possible is quite incredible in its own right. Inside the body of a munfish, there is a pocket dimension of sorts with infinite space within it. Floating around in the void that is Kun Chan's stomach, Liu thinks about how exactly this space works. Objects that are swallowed by Kun Chan and brought into this space will be digested in a fairly short amount of time. He himself is protected from that digestion thanks to the aqua armor layer on his body right now. The white snake from White Palace wasn't so lucky though. By now, it's already long gone, leaving behind only a spirit pill with its power held within it. After looking around a bit, Liu finds that pill and floats over to grab it. With it grasped in his fist, he tells Kun Chan that this is one of many valuable items that can help both himself and his beasts grow in power at an extraordinarily fast pace. Now that he's secured the pill, he calls out for Kun Chan to let him out. Later, Liu stands out on solid ground once more. The actual process of him getting out of Kun Chan's belly is less than usual, so it hasn't been shown. He got pooped out, didn't he? Now, standing before his beasts, Liu explains that normally, spirit beasts must have their spiritual power enhanced in order to get stronger. The usual method for this is through grueling training and real combat experience. Unfortunately, that's a very slow and tedious process. So, rather than going down that route, they'll be taking a different method entirely. A shortcut even, if you will. With that said, he brings out the pill he retrieved from inside Ku Chan. Holding it before his dog beast, he tells it to consume the pill since it's a wild animal-based spirit pill, matching his own nature. Sure enough, as soon as the dog eats the pill, he's overtaken with a golden glow. Thanks to his affinity with the pill, his spiritual power has been enhanced even without any training. 
On top of that, his own beasts are still rookie levels. The White Snake, whose power is within that pill, on the other hand, was a champion level 5. His spiritual power was easily twice that of the dog, if not more. The large level gap is another benefit, as it means the dog will strengthen just that much more. And what's more true to Liu's words, the dog rises all the way from rookie level 8 to champion level 6. His bandages fly off his body as he grows in size and gains two new skills, incursion and wild howl. As the dog gets used to its new appearance, Liu explains that this is the training method they'll be utilizing from here on out. They'll search for spirit beasts that are wild animal-based, plant-based and water-based in this forest. Each beast will be swallowed by Kunshan, at which point they'll be digested and transformed into spirit pills. Then, Liu will go back inside to retrieve those pills. Finally, by consuming the pills that align with their nature, each of his three spirit beasts will grow exponentially and reach unheard of heights of power. Then, once they're strong enough that none can challenge them, there will be nothing in the way of Liu's quest to rebuild his clan. Afterwards, the eager beasts end up pouncing on a little lizard beast that they find scurrying across the ground. After capturing it, they turn to their master expectantly. However, while the lizard is indeed a wild animal-based spirit beast, it has an extremely low level. Even if it were to be consumed, the power boost to his dog beast would be so tiny that it might as well not even happen. If they truly want to get powerful, they'll have to look for the strongest of beasts. After telling them to just let the lizard go, Lu leads his beast to a nearby clearing. Here, resting in the middle of a pond, stands a great wild animal-based spirit beast of the toad tribe. As the name would suggest, it's a giant toad with a poison sub-attribute and a level of champion 5. Yeah, that's going to be a little harder than the average lizard to capture. The battle against the toad beast turns out to be a terribly difficult one. Even so, Liu and his own spirit beasts have managed to come out on top, if only just barely. There's one major issue though. Despite being defeated and swallowed by Kunshan, the toad hit all of them with enough poison to leave them on the ground, gasping for breath. The vine beast is laying face down on the ground, unable to even move. Liu is just barely capable of shifting around a little bit. Kun Chan perhaps has it the worst of them all. Laying in place, shriveled up and exhausted, the toxic fumes of the toad's poison are rising from the mudfish's own mouth. Sitting up with great difficulty, Liu mentally scolds himself for being careless enough to get hit with the beast's poison. And as if that wasn't bad enough on its own, the poison seems to be an extremely strong one too. His vine beast is practically smoking from under its bandages with the toxic fumes. Meanwhile, he himself is more than a little affected. Already he can see the effects of the poison spraying through his body and towards the tips of his fingers. If he doesn't do something and fast, this poison will be the end of him here and now. Forget restoring the clan, he won't even be able to make use of this second life in the first place. However, Right as these depressing thoughts are going through Liu's mind, the poison suddenly recedes. As he's watching, the purple tint of toxic liquid coursing through his veins disappears completely. Confused as all hell, he's startled when he hears his dog beast happily woofing at him from the side. He seems to be wholly unaffected by the poison of the toad in any and every way, shape and form. With a jolt, Liu realizes that he must be the one countering the effects of the poison on him. He praises the dog, and for the sake of both his curiosity and excitement, he asks how he managed to cure the poison. Rather than answering, since you know, he's a dog, the beast decides to show him instead. And what a sight it is. Right before Liu's eyes, he walks up to the vine beast, raises one of his hind legs and lets loose a stream of pee right at the little guy. Ah yeah sure, why not? As stated on the status sheet from the previous town, the dog beast's urine does have purifying properties, at least as far as poisons are concerned. Once they're all recovered from that unfortunate incident, both the poisoning and the peeing, Liu gathers the pills they've managed to secure. In digesting the toad, Kuhn was able to produce not just one but two spirit pills. One is of the wild beast type while the other is a water type. As such, they'll be given to Little Dog and Kuhn Cham, respectively. Of course, this leaves one of the pets hanging out to dry. Vine Beast has an adorably upset expression on his face at the lack of any upgrades, but both his fellow beasts and Liu are quick to console him. Liu assures the little guy that despite plant-based beasts being rather rare, they'll make sure to find some so he can grow as well. Besides, Liu has bigger plans for them all now that he's had time to work something out. Thanks to their method of getting stronger, they can level up about 20 times faster than through normal means. Just one week training here is the equivalent of a full year for other people. The only catch is that since they'll be leveling up without the matching battle experience, their combat power will be quite low. 
Because of this, Liu will be putting them through some special training to make up for that. It's going to be insanely hard. That much you can assure them. Over the course of the next two weeks, all three of Liu's spirit beasts undergo the absolute most hellish training possible, growing in strength by leaps and bounds throughout it. Now that their power has reached an acceptable level, Liu has decided it's time to return to the Ling Xiao clan's base. And so, mounted atop the trusty pig that first carried him away from the White Palace, Liu travels across the lands. Eventually, he reaches his old home, only to find it in a terrible state of disrepair. From cracks in the walls to plants growing across the deserted looking place, it's truly heartbreaking for him to see. However, his sadness quickly shifts into shock and anger at what he sees when he enters the grounds themselves. Right there, one of the members of his clan is lying defeated on the ground, his spirit beasts seemingly dead behind him. As he bleeds out from a gash in his shoulder, the clan member is talked down to by the members of another group. The very people who have put him in this condition, the Bang Clan. The group's leader has an ultimate level 1 desert ground dragon of the wild beast type. This is how he's defeated his opponents so easily. With a smug smirk on his face, he tells them all to get out of here or die. The Bang Clan is claiming this property as their own. One of his companions even calls them a loser clan that doesn't deserve to occupy such a spiritual land. Infuriated, another member of the clan stands to fight and yells out at them. The enraged clan member summons forth his own spirit beast, the Dark Illusion Felis Beast, a wild animal-based beast of the Cat Tribe with a darkness sub-attribute. Most importantly though, it is of ultimate level 3. As incredible as that all sounds I have to say, cute kitty. The members of the Bang Clan aren't concerned in the slightest however, confident that they're at the top of the food chain. They state that since this must be the last spirit beast under the clan, all they need to do is kill it. Then, the Ling Xiao clan will fully become theirs to do with as they please. At a single order from the group's leader, the other members call forth their own spirit beasts as well. A champion level 9 insect-based dynasty and beast of the Beetle tribe. An ultimate level 1 wild animal-based volcanic turtle beast of the turtle tribe with the sub-attribute of Earth, Together with the Desert Ground Dragon, they believe their victory is already assured. Yeah, that's usually only the case for the good guys folks. Despite their casual and uncaring attitudes towards his spirit beast, the young man who became enraged earlier gives no reaction. In fact, he even smirks at them. They have no idea what's in store for them. With just three words, he sends forth his spirit beast, affectionately named Little Me. Tear them apart. Before anyone can react, Little Me dashes forward reaching speeds that some of them can't even see. The group's leader attempts to organize his fighters. However, the cat is simply too fast. When the desert ground dragon tries to swat at her with its tail, the cat simply pounces around it and slices the whole tail into a barbie platter. This is the shadow iron cutter technique, utilizing the beast's sharp claws to their fullest extent. Next, Little Me rushes at the volcanic turtle beast. The creature quickly retreats into its own spike shell, which it then rolls forward in for a frontal assault. From there, Little Me leaps right up into the air to avoid being skewered. Then, from up in the air above the turtle, the cat leaps down with a powerful slash of both front limbs. With this move, Cross Iron Cutter, the turtle is reduced to little more than a collection of evenly cut blocks. Turn that boy into Legos. Finally, Little Me turns to the last of the enemy beasts, the Dynasty Beast. With a quick, spiraling dash, the cat pierces right through the beetle's underbelly and comes out of its back. In the process, she cuts a spiral pattern into said back with the piercing iron cutter skill. The beetle looks more like a cinnamon roll now, albeit a disgusting one. With all the enemy's spirit beasts down for the count, Lumi's master starts smugly taunting them. He throws their own words from earlier back at them, asking why such losers thought they deserved to face the Ling Xiao clan. Unfortunately, the young man has underestimated just how shameless and dishonorable his opponents are. At their leader's command, the Beetle Beast is silently ordered to shoot its trunk at the spectating members of the Ling Xiao clan, namely Gao Ling. And just as they had planned, Little Me jumps in front of them to cut the projectile into bits. Unfortunately for her, the enemy was counting on that. While she's still in the air, the Desert Ground Dragon pops up from out of nowhere and bites down into the Cat Beast. As blood pours down the beast's back like a river, her master can only cry out in horror at what has just happened. The Desert Ground Dragon viciously bites into Lumi's body, absolutely brutalizing the poor cat before tossing off the side. Her master dashes to her side, devastated by the sight of her crushed body. As blood leaks out from the cat beast's jaws and she lets out a defeated whimper of pain, the young man holds her tightly in a hug, begging her to just hold on. 
Meanwhile, the Bang Clan's members are loudly celebrating the fall of what they believe is their last obstacle. With this, the Ling Xiao Clan now truly has no spirit beasts left. Their clan can finally move in and crush them into powder right here and now. The leader commands his desert ground dragon forward, claiming that every last one of them are idiots to think they still have any place in this world. If he wished it, he could wipe out every single one of them with almost no effort. And now, that's exactly what he's going to do. As Little Me's master sits with her cradled in his arms, tears streaming down his face with no end, the desert ground dragon opens its salivating jaw. This man will die here and now. At least, that was their plan. Before the dragon can initiate an actual attack, something flies into its face from the side, knocking its head sideways. Shocked and infuriated, the Bang Clan leader demands to know who did that. With no hesitation, a young man steps into their view, a little puppy held in his arm to restrict its movement. As he walks their way, he asks the Bang Clan just how stupid they are to dare to mess with his Ling Xiao Clan. Hearing these words sparks something in Gao Ling, who's watching this scene with just as much interest as everyone else. As she looks at the newcomer, she can't help but see the image of the clan's Grand Master. That quickly fades though, revealing Liu's face. More embarrassed than ever, Gao Ling's face lights up in a blush as her eyes widen and she tries to blame the mistake on her poor eyesight. Turning to her fellow clan members, she asks if any of them know or have any clue who this new person is. However, none of them have any idea just who this man may be. On the other hand, the Bang Clan group's leader is confused as to who this is as well, but he doesn't care nearly as much. His main concern is getting him to either get lost or killing him. Yeah, good luck with that generic villain number 73. When he issues that ultimatum to Liu, the young man simply tells him this place is ruled by him. With any attempt at conversation seeming useless, he tilts his head down to the little dog and lets him loose. He tells him to show these guys everything he's gained from their training and to beat them to a pulp. Amused, the Bang Clan group simply laughed at his actions. They're fully confident that a little dog beast, a mere champion level 1 at that, is no match at all for their own beasts. He orders his desert ground dragon to take the little dog out. But as the beast swings its web hand at the little guy, he activates the basic skill known only as defensive ball. Curling into himself, the dog forms a ball-like shape and protects himself from all damage in a super basic move. Despite how basic the move is though, it fully nullifies the desert ground dragon's attack, shocking all the enemies. Never in even their wildest dreams would they have imagined seeing what's before them now. Not only has the tiny little dog defended completely from an attack of his dragon, but it also counterattacks with an extremely powerful and fierce slap to the beast's jaw. With that simple move, the dragon's head spins to the side, blood flying out of its mouth. The Bang Clan couldn't possibly be more shocked at what they've just seen, but this is just the beginning. Next, the little dog uses a skill called Unstoppable Paw Attack, and it is exactly what the name implies actually. Quite literally, a complete barrage of paw smacks to the dragon's head and neck. In just moments, the creature has been brutalized to a degree none of them thought possible. Before the desert ground dragon can recover in any way, the little dog makes his next move, the finisher. Moving around and shifting as if he's a pro wrestler, the little dog wraps his body around the dragon's scales and launches off with an especially fierce blow. With that, a shockwave is felt from the point of impact as the dragon goes flying, crashing into the ground with nothing to show but an absolutely humiliating defeat. The men of the Bang Clan can only ogle at the fallen body of Desert Ground Dragon, unable to comprehend what has just happened. Just how in the world can it be possible for a mere dog beast to take down their Ground Dragon? For his part, Li was simply staring at them with a hand on his face, said face being adorned with the smuggest of smiles. Internally, he's thinking about how exactly he managed to pull that off despite the odds being against him. For one thing, these guys suffer from a severe lack of actual practical combat experience. On top of that, the thing that was thrown at the dragon's head at the start of the battle was actually his dog beast Yuri, which is now capable of weakening its targets as well. First Healy and now this? Just what is up with this dog's piss? Regardless, since they had no idea that the dragon had been weakened, its defeat is even more jarring to them since they think it was at full strength. Talk about some screwy mind games. Suddenly, the Bang Clan members seem to realize their current situation. Altogether, they come to the same conclusion in a creepy level of synchronization. This new guy is all on his own even if his dog beast is weirdly OP. On the other hand, they have a massive numbers advantage. If they can properly work that to their benefit here, they can still salvage the situation. With that goal in mind, the group leader orders the rest of them to summon every spirit beast they have at their disposal. 
Every single one of them is to be summoned here and now so they can overwhelm this crazy kid. Sure enough, in just a moment several spirit beasts have been called forth. Among these are a huge bear, a massive centipede, a giant spiked frog, a tree with a face in it, and one in the world. The last two are what can only be described as a living tornado and a very angry-looking large pinball. Though their beasts may not be stronger than that strange dog, they have such a ridiculous advantage in numbers that the group leader is confident in their victory. Especially when taking into consideration the fact that he has no plans to play fair. Rather than trying to fight the dog any further, the leader orders his group to go straight for the beast tamer behind it. They'll be shocked at their cowardly decision. Liu wastes no time responding accordingly. He's infuriated at their actions since they make a mockery of true tamers, but it's hardly the time to try and give them a detailed lecture on that. Stepping through a doorway, Liu quickly spins around and leans on the wall as he waits for the Bang Clan's guys to come after him. Moments later, they come racing through, determined to find him. They don't have to look for long. The wall he's leaning on to wait for them is right next to the door. What Liu wanted was for all their spirit beasts to come through that narrow door. Now that they have, they're all within range of his second beast, the Vine Monster at max champion level. In a single swift move, the Vine Monster binds every last one of the spirit beasts and ties them up together in a ball. Not only are the Bang Clan men already horrified by the new beast and its level of power, but Liu's next words strike even more fear into them. He speaks to a being called Kun Chan and tells it that someone has gathered a meal for it. Instantly, a giant flying fish breaks through the ranks of the Bang Clan and arrives to see all the spirit beasts hide neatly together. In one extremely quick move, the beasts are all enveloped in one large mouth and swallowed by him. The champion max level mudfish is in the way the whole time. As the Bang Clan's guys sit on the floor, terrified by what just happened, Liu just looks down at them with a smile. The bald leader of the group simply tells Liu that he recognizes that fish beast as the baby form of a coon. The fact that he still has one, despite the coon being banned by the League, means that he can be threatened. All he has to do is threaten to tell the League about him, at which point Liu will be completely at their mercy. That's what went through the first guy's head of course, but he's far from able to execute the plan. The second Liu hears his threat, he asks how they'll report anything from the belly of a great coon. The guys are so utterly terrified by the idea of being eaten that they instantly give up and apologize to Liu for their words. Liu simply brushes them off and orders Little Dog to handle them, which he does, by projectile peeing into each of their faces without hesitation. Liu explains that he was already prepared for the case of someone finding out about his coon. What they've just been sprayed with is the Little Dog's pee of forgetting. With this, they'll forget everything that has happened. Seriously. Healing, weakening, and now this? Little Dog's pee is really universal for problem solving, isn't it? At that exact moment, Gao Ling emerges from the main grounds to the area they're all currently in. She's more confused than ever though when she finds the group from Bang Clan just standing there clueless. Not only have they forgotten everything since coming here, they don't know what's happened to all their spirit beasts either. Those are fish food now. Making use of both Little Dog and his vine monster, Liu is able to scare off the confused Bang Clan members. With them gone, Gao Ling turns to thank Liu sincerely for all his help protecting the clan. Before she can finish her sentence, Liu suddenly grabs her in a tight embrace and tells her it's really good to see all of them again. As he has Ling trapped in the embrace with him, he fails to realize what kind of message it must be sending to her. Sure enough, the young woman comes to the conclusion that Liu wants her to pay him back with her body as a reward. Well, that's not very family-friendly of her. Before she can voice her concerns, though, Liu pulls away from her with a bright smile on his face. Holding onto her by her shoulders, he tells her he knows she probably can't recognize him in his current state. He's just about to tell her his true identity when he's suddenly struck with a realization. He can't reveal his true identity. Back when he was killed in the botched evolution process of his coon, someone had to have purposely caused the transformation of his celestial coon into a zombie coon. If that person is still lurking around, or worse yet, one of his clan members, then revealing himself could be a massive risk. That person could just decide to come after him again and finish their job, never giving him a moment to relax. And with the current level of power of Iza especially, Liu will be unable to defend against any such attacks. Taking all those factors into consideration, it'll be best if he just keeps his identity a secret for now. Instead, he breaks into laughter in front of Ling and tells her that he mistook her for someone he knew. He then introduces himself properly as Liu Fengmeng and claims to be a simple gardener. Yeah because gardeners can handle a whole group like the one he just beat earlier. Luckily, Ling is too overwhelmed to really question it and just takes him at his word. She introduces herself as Shu Rong Ling, 
aka Gao Ling, and tells him his help is greatly appreciated. Then, secret identity or not, Liu grabs her by the arm and rushes to meet everyone else. Even if he can't make it a true reunion right now, he can at least see all his old comrades who he sorely missed since being reborn. Back in the clan's courtyard, they arrive to everyone's praise and gratitude for Liu's actions. What draws his attention more than that, however, is the master of Liu Mi. Clutching the cat's body to his chest, he's mourning the creature's death. Seeing this, Liu is reminded of the day he first got little Mi for this particular comrade of his. Long ago now, he spent a full day hunting down the illusion using beasts with this man at his side. When they finally capture it, he saw how much admiration the young man held for the cat beast and gifted it to him on the spot. To compare that scene of happiness to what is playing out before him now breaks Liu's heart. Even more so when he hears the young man's next words. He's leaving the Ling Shao clan. With his beast now fallen as well, there are no spirit beasts left in the clan and he truly believes all hope is lost. Coming from a place of intense sorrow, he stands and walks past Liu, moving to leave the clan behind him for good. Remembering his times with this man, Liu desperately tries to stop him, even going as far as to make some extremely bold claims. Claims like one that he can help them revive their clan. This only serves to infuriate the young man even more though. Turning with tears in his eyes, he looks at Liu with a burning hatred. He tells him their great clan was once the strongest in the entire world. His meager power means nothing in the face of what they once were. And yet, look at them now. There's not a damn thing left for them to hold on to anymore. Seeing how heated the exchange is getting, Ron Ling gets between the two in an attempt to smooth things over. She tells her senior clan member to calm down while at the same time she tells Liu that he's just overcome with grief right now and doesn't mean what he's saying. I mean, I agree he's definitely real sad right now, but he definitely means the stuff he just said, lady. The current situation reminds Liu of a particular point in time far in the past, back when he was first establishing the Ling Xiao clan, back when it was just him and a rundown old base with an ad put out for new members. Way back then, the first person to show up was a brash young man with a rough attitude who did little more than criticize everything he saw. From the lack of members to the small size of the base to the bleak accommodations and even matters of personal preference. He picked apart the entirety of Liu's efforts in just moments. And yet, despite all of that, he asked only one question. The purpose of this clan is to become the strongest in the world. Is it truly his own desire and is he confident he can make it come true? When Liu confidently answered in the positive, that was all he needed to sign himself up as a member. The very first member of the Ling Xiao clan other than the founder. Now, that very man is standing in front of Liu once more. But this time is a broken shell of his former self. Everything he loved, everything he cared for has been stolen away from him. His clan, his master, even the spirit beast entrusted to him by said master. It's all gone. What reason does he have to keep going anymore? Rong Ling tries to call out to him and tell him they must protect their grand master's will. But this only sets him off even further as he screams out that the master is dead. The Ling Xiao clan was able to stand proud as what it was because of him. And now with him gone and everything they built together having crumbled to dust, he just doesn't believe there's any hope left for them. Ron Ling finally calls him by his name, Duan Di, and practically begs him not to go. But Duan's mind is already made up. Tears bursting from his eyes, he screams at Ron Ling to accept the truth, that the Ling Xiao clan died one year ago along with their master. With his peace said, Duan Di leaves the clan grounds, calling back to them to begin a new life. Tearfully, Rong Ling begs some of the other disciples to stop Duan, but she's horrified to find they actually share his sentiments. With everything having been taken from them, they can't find it in themselves to refute Duan's words. If anything, his speech just now was the last straw for most of them who were just barely holding on to hope. They have to accept that there's simply no future anymore with the clan. Though it greatly saddens them all, they apologize to Rong Ling and move towards the exit as well. Right as they're leaving, Liu screams out for all of them to stop. He's more than tempted to just throw caution to the wind and reveal his true identity. That way he can restore their hopes. But he can't bring himself to do it. After all, if the one targeting him learns he's back, he may well just be putting a target on all the other clan members as well. Unable to provide the comfort of his true identity, he instead begs them to believe in him and just give him a little time. He swears he can make the Ling Xiao clan prosperous once again. However, even though he did save them just now, Liu is simply a complete stranger to all of them. One they have no reason to place such faith in. Altogether, the disciples of the Ling Xiao clan bow before the clan's entrance. After paying their respects, a lot of them step away, going off to continue their lives and leaving the clan behind them. Unknown to them, they've also turned their back on their master, who's sitting on his knees, 
tears streaming down his cheeks. Sitting there, his life's work left in shambles before his eyes, Liu can only make desperate pleas for them not to leave him. Alas, not a single one of his begging words are heard. Ron Ling is also crying inconsolably at what has just happened. That is, until one person shows up. The youngest disciple of the clan, Zheng Hai. A boy Ron Ling recruited herself, seeing him trying to console her. Ron Ling puts aside her sadness in favor of shock that he has chosen to stay. In response to that, he just tells her that she saved him when he was on the verge of death. How could he possibly leave her here alone after that? Ron Ling just pats the young boy's head, comforted by his words. She starts apologizing to the kid for bringing him into the clan when the situation is so rough, but he tells her to not say such things. Ron Ling brings up that it's just the two of them left now though, so she's not really sure what to do. Just then, a third person's voice interrupts them as yet another person who has stayed back appears. The maid of the Liang Xiao clan, Yu Tong, Mommy. Oh, crap. Never mind. Just my intrusive thoughts. At Ling's surprise that she's still here, Yua reminds her that not only does she have nowhere else to go, but she also signed a five-year contract with the Grandmaster that isn't over yet. Well then, not the best reasons I suppose, but as long as she's staying unhappy. As the two talk about the situation, Zheng Hai suddenly interrupts and points out to Rong Ling that Liu is still sitting on his own nearby. Embarrassed that she forgot about him like that, Ling rushes over to Liu and apologizes for ignoring him up until just now. As an apology and also a thank you for saving them, she asks if he would like to have lunch with them. Liu's mind, however, is somewhere else entirely, slowly turning to Ling. He says just one thing. He wants to join the clan. Of course, after what just happened earlier, this shocks Ling who wasn't expecting such a request. Meanwhile, a reel of memories from his past life is playing in Liu's head. Wanting to investigate the elimination of his fan family, he founded this clan to become the second grand one. With the purpose of finding the truth, he focused solely on improving himself and used his own power to beat other clans. And yet, throughout it all, even as the clan's status rose more and more, Liu barely ever bothered to look after his disciples properly. He didn't train them even half as hard as he did himself. Hell, he didn't even try. All of them placed their faith in him to take them to the top, and yet, the only one he ever bothered to make stronger was himself. If he had only been more attentive to them, if he'd been a better Grandmaster, perhaps this wouldn't be the state of the clan today. Ron Ling starts telling Liu that he doesn't need to sympathize with the clan and puts himself in a tough spot. However, Liu just grabs her by the shoulders and screams out to the heavens above that he will revive the Liang Xiao clan no matter what, moved by his determination. Ron Ling accepts to have Liu join the clan. Taking him to a special room, she tells him this is where they'll hold a simple joining ceremony. He must bow down before a portrait of the Grandmaster. That is to say, himself. Except, the portrait is kind of crappy to be honest. Regardless of how strange it feels to be bowing down to a poor imitation of himself, Liu puts his heart and soul into pledging allegiance to the clan. His intensity even surprises Ling and Zheng Hai. Rong Ling just tells the junior that for some reason, Liu feels very familiar to her and makes her feel like she can trust him. Yeah, that's definitely just a coincidence. Once Liu's joining ceremony is complete, the other two take him on a quick tour of the clan. Though it really is quick since it's a fairly small place. While showing Liu the bedroom for male disciples, Ling tells him they don't actually have any more uniforms so he can just stick to his own clothes for now. After that, she proceeds to teach Liu their clan's password. With his entrance into the clan complete and the tour done, Ling takes him to the dining hall. Here, the Amazon that is Yu Wetong walks in with a good number of dishes and tells him to try them out. Things might look bleak for the Liang Kyo clan now, but with its Grandmaster back once more, the days of its glory aren't nearly as far out of reach as they have been this past year. No matter what happens from here on out, Liu will make sure that his clan prospers, not only like before, but as an even greater clan than ever. The end, for now.